Hello everybody, it's Dr. Weber, and today we're going to talk about adapted physical activity lesson planning, how to create a lesson plan that is standardized and also inclusive enough to include people with developmental and intellectual disabilities in your physical education setting. So when we first think about teaching, you want to have the enthusiasm and with itness that goes along with it. You have to be excited once your students enter the room. You have to be engaged with the teacher assistants or mentors that are providing you assistance. And you have to have with itness. You have to um, be quick on your feet. You have to be prepared. You have to know what you're going to teach. Have a three by five card or a lesson plan right near you so that you can look at it if you need to. Don't feel like you're doing this alone, so get as many people as you need to help get equipment for you, um, uh, pick up equipment for you. Don't feel like you're alone when you're teaching. So the first thing I wanna think about as a adaptive physical educator or activity instructor is have enthusiasm. Be excited, have fun, that's number one. Number two is with itness. Uh, being aware of the surroundings, um, being aware of safety hazards, being aware of people's personalities, being aware, aware of spatial awareness or uh, how, people, how close people are together, um, if people can see you, uh, if, if something, someone's doing something dangerous, that you have the with itness to um, react right away and with the proper uh, protocols. So next we're going to talk about objectives and exercise selection. So when you are choosing objectives, you can look at the national and state standards that apply for physical education, and you can find some cool objectives in there that reflect the affective, cognitive, and psychomotor domains. We're mainly going to be working within the psychomotor domain aspect, but we do want to include things like cognitive domain, whether they understand things, so the ability for them to be able to recite, list, describe, discuss, analyze, evaluate things. So literally asking them questions about the content they're learning. And if they're able to understand it, they'll be able to say certain things that are related to the content and able to answer questions. So basically like test questions or multiple choice or giving them the ability to reflect or discuss what they're learning. That is the cognitive domain. The affective domain is their ability to follow the rules, uh, communicate effectively, collaborate effectively, and stay positive through a social um, atmosphere. So whether they're cheering people on, giving each other encouragement, those are all positive affective qualities. So you might be able to observe this in some of our students as they cheer each other on, share with each other. Um, they can also teach each other so we can have them give, we can give them leadership opportunities for instance, in, during this freeze dance song, we have the students go up and lead the class. That shows their ability to lead others. That would be an affective quality. Um, and then demonstrating it would be the psychomotor domain. So the psychomotor domain is their ability to perform any exercise or motor control uh, movement, such as object control exercises, like swinging a bat bouncing a ball or dribbling a ball, kicking a ball, swinging a racket, uh, throwing a ball, trapping a ball. These types of things are psychomotor uh, motor objectives or object control skills. Then we have locomotor skills like skipping, hopping, galloping, jumping, running, sliding. Uh, these are going to be the skills that we'll look at when we're performing dynamic movements on the gymnasium floor. And we always want to make sure we're incorporating both, if not um, each uh, locomotor skill if we can during our warm-up. Then we want to think about make it make sense. Okay, When we're lesson planning we want to make sure that we are making it make sense. When we look at our lesson plans does it make sense to us? Can we explain it easily? And is there less than three to four rules pertaining the skill or game that we're performing? For instance when we play red light green light pretty direct. I want everyone to line up on the end line. When I say green light, you're going to walk forward. When I say red light, you're going to stop. When I say yellow light, I want you to balance on one foot. Let's practice each. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and start. Ready? And boom. So I described it in less than 30 seconds. I gave them 
chance to perform the exercise or activity, then we perform the activity all within 30 seconds. So if it's over 30 seconds, you're going to complicate things. So make sure you're direct in providing simple directions and simple activities or exercises that everyone can do. If we overcomplicate things, create too many lines or too many people waiting, we're going to have a lot of um, uh, maybe perhaps behavioral issues where people are lacking motivation and they're going to want to do something else. Um, when there's slow transition times, this gives people a chance to um, just kind of look, maybe look at their phones or ask their teachers questions or, um, you know, kind of get distracted. So make sure that you have quick transitions, quick directions, you're snappy, you have that with itness when you're teaching and you're providing simple directions. Let's go back to objectives and exercise selection. So you have psychomotor, affective, and cognitive objectives. They're all found within the standards in your state and um, national standards. You can use the objectives to create your lesson plans. They can help when you are, say, teaching an activity, but you don't know what type of affective or cognitive exercise or activity you could add in there to provide value. Remember, we want to make sure that we're getting all three domains when we're teaching. We're not just teaching psychomotor of skills. Next, when we think about exercise selection, I have a document that you should have. Uh, if you're one of my students, if you don't have, make sure that you email me or uh, DM me if you need the link. But it's going to provide from breathing to mobility to stability to dynamic movements to strength exercises, all the exercises that I think are the best ones to enact inside of a classroom. Now, I will have selective exercises because doing this after 10 years or so, or even more, 15 years, getting into almost 20 years of teaching, I've learned that there's specific exercises that work and don't work. So I'm not gonna have students perform burpees because most of the students aren't gonna be able to perform burpees. So you wanna make sure that you're providing an exercise like an air squat or a push-up hold or a bridge on the back, something direct, simple, and easy enough for everyone to do or to be able to provide some regressions and progressions for each exercise. But when you do that, then it means that you're gonna to have to talk more, give more directions, look at different people. So if you can find exercises that everyone can do that are simple enough that get the target or the bigger muscles, not just like a bicep curl or a, a lateral shoulder raise because that's only limited to the movement or the muscle that's being performed. So something like a, a, a complex movement or a, a multi-joint movement like a squat or a bridge um, where you're using more than just one muscle. So in performing exercises in the warm-up, make sure you choose mobility, stability, and strength exercises that can be performed for 30 to 60 seconds or have a 15 second movement patterns that you can go through and have four exercises per minute. And you have to time these efficiently or you will either go over in time or under in time. So if you're teaching a 10 minute mobility or warm up, you need to make sure that you account for each minute that you're teaching each exercise so that you know exactly what exercise you're teaching for what minute. Otherwise, you're gonna go over in time and you're gonna bleed into your dynamic portion. So after your first 10 minutes of exercises or warm-ups, which should be breathing, mobility, stability, and strength exercises, you're gonna perform dynamic movements like locomotor skills. So whether that's through a game that involves skipping, hopping, jumping, uh, sliding, uh, this could be a red light, green light game, this could be a sharks and minnows game. You may even just perform dynamic cross the court locomotor skills uh, to be really direct and simple. You may do that prior to red light, green light or, or prior to sharks and minnows. You could add in things like uh, hungry hippos where they have to move somewhere and then move back to their group setting or station. Um, these are all different dynamic things you can do on the gymnasium floor. This is where you want them to be moving, performing locomotor skills with the music and, and getting them expressing movement, whether through, that's through agility, reaction time, coordination, balance, uh, and strength. 
After this is over, we've been 20 minutes through our lesson plan. So first you start off with some mat warm-up exercises followed by dynamic locomotor skills or movement patterns. Then you're gonna move into dance, kickboxing, um, or it can be something related or in between those skills. So teaching a uh, teacher-led dance or a group dance that people are familiar with like YMCA or Keep It Shuffle, um, but you still have to show them the movements. You have to um, have your back to them and so that they can follow your patterns if you're going right or left, or you have to have them mirror you um, and say, if I'm going right, they're going left. So you have to make sure that you understand that my right is your left if you're teaching kickboxing or if you're dancing, for instance. So after 20 minutes, you start your dynamic dance or kickboxing. Uh, you can also include any other type of workout you'd like here. So if you wanted to break um, the dynamic and the um, dancer kickboxing segment into one workout, you could have stations for those 20 minutes where they stay at each station for five minutes and there's four stations. You could have like a carry station, a medicine ball slam station. You could have a pulling station and maybe a pushing station, but you'd have to have all the equipment out if you did that. So you can mix and match your first 30 minutes. The first 30 minutes should be basic movements, but gets the body warmed up, gets everyone active, everyone feels included, should feel like a group workout to start, followed by group um, cooperative games where it's not about competition, it's about having fun, and it's about moving throughout the gymnasium floor. Then you can get into things like dance or kickboxing, um, or you can vice versa and change that around. Basically the first 30 minutes should be dynamic movement. Once we've gone 30 minutes in our lesson plan, we need to start or have started, if you wanna start early, you can, your sport or your fitness section. So if you're teaching a sport, make sure you're individualizing the skills so everyone has a piece of their own equipment. For example, soccer, you have your own soccer ball, basketball, your own basketball, get them in a circle. If it's lacrosse, a lacrosse stick, um, maybe you're just having them hold on a lacrosse stick, maybe you're not giving them the ball yet, you're having them do some things with lacrosse stick, moving around the court. Um, maybe it's just having them warm up with a lacrosse stick so that they're getting familiar with it, or the, the tennis rackets or pickleball rackets so that they can get familiar with it during their warm up. So you can include these things in your warm up if you'd like, um, because they'll be using them. Sometimes like a soccer ball or basketball will be a little bit too distracting, but when you're including these individual skills, make sure everyone has the piece of equipment and you start from scratch. So if you're teaching pickleball, I might even use a poly spot and flip a poly spot just to see if they can um, have, get that wrist action to flip the poly spot to get them to see if they can stabilize the poly spot. Maybe you do a red light, green light with a poly spot on the paddle. Then you put the wiffle ball or a yarn ball on, and that would be your next progression and maybe you're just doing some taps or maybe you're hitting it on the ground so skills like that would be great for pickleball or soccer so you might start with just some toe taps or some tick tocks or some dribbling around the court and then when I say freeze everyone freeze and then it could be a red light green light soccer game it could be a hungry hippos soccer game it could be the same thing for basketball lacrosse um, lacrosse could do a hungry hippos lacrosse could still do a red light green light just with having some uh, lacrosse control. So think about these things as you're, as you're lesson planning. If you're teaching something like volleyball, then you might have, you might get into small groups or everyone has a balloon. Everyone has a balloon, keep it up in the air, and then you transition to groups of four to six with beach balls. Beach balls, what you do is get in a circle, have them try to keep it up. And then you have those groups go against each other using tennis uh, nets. So that's how you would um, provide uh, the skills for volleyball. Now, if you're teaching basketball, individual skills in a circle for about 10 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of passing, and then 10 minutes of shooting. If it's soccer, same thing. 10 minutes individual skills, 10 minutes passing, 10 minutes some type of game. And these uh, skills can be games as well. So you can, if it's a passing uh, time if you're passing or if you're shooting it can be with cones in and around, around cones we can do red light green light soccer basketball um, you could do red light green light with volleyball with uh, balloons you could do hungry hippos with soccer ball you do hungry hippos with basketball 
and lacrosse. Um, volleyball, you could do lacrosse balls so they could run out to the middle and they could serve it to the person uh, that's at their hula hoop. So these are all different things you can do with the different sports. So let's go back to start. When we're lesson planning, the first 10 minutes, we're doing mat exercises to get them warmed up, followed by dynamic movements and dance, kickboxing. So about 30 minutes of dynamic movement to start. If you wanna cut it short to get into your sport, quicker you can. Then you're getting into your sport or fitness activity. If you're performing a sport, start with individualized skills that are simple, then followed by um, passing or one-on-one um, -on -one or 2v2 or um, small group um, skills, then followed by some type of cooperative game with the whole class or mini stations with specific skills. If you have stations, think you're gonna be explaining the stations, so that's gonna take five minutes, and then also they're gonna have to transition through the station, so that's another five minutes on top of how many minutes you want them to stay per station. So you can have stations for the last 30 minutes if you'd like, but you probably do want to start with their own equipment so they can get familiar with the, the sport to start. Okay. Now we're going to talk about having your back to wall when you're teaching or making sure everyone can see you when you're teaching. You never want to be teaching to just some of the group with your back to students. So make sure that you're always back to wall. So we call it back to wall mentality. Um, when we talk about um, the the format or how you're gonna coordinate activities, you can do so in different ways. So first you can have an end line where everyone gets on the, um, the width of the court at the end line, or you can use the long line where they're using the length of the court and they're getting on that long line. So you get a little bit more room when you're on that long line, you're gonna have more room to kind of go across the court. So that's what I like for dynamic exercises, pacer, Obviously you do the long line approach, but using that short line is when you can do stuff like red light, green light, maybe sharks and minnows. Uh, when you're performing sharks and minnows, since there's so many people, you might just call out colors first so that you're not having people trip over each other. Um, red light, green light, you don't necessarily need to do that. Um, you can use the approach of stations where um, each group, mini group, you could have eight to 10 stations um, surrounding the gym, or you can, if there's people out you can uh, match stations so having at least six to ten stations and then that way you're not just having long lines um, you can do circle approach where everyone gets in a circle you can have one side versus the other side if you're performing some type of game like flag tag or flag um, capture the flag um, when you're um, seated you want to let's see oh you can also have the students scattered so you can have them scattered out, whether that's in hula hoops or on poly spots, um, or just telling them that they're, they need to find their own space within the court. That's always a good way to teach individual skills. Um, and then for dance and kickboxing, you want to have about four to six lines of about six to eight students across. So get, making sure that it's not just everyone clumped together, that they are separated and they have room to kick and punch and do all the different uh, dancing exercises. So make sure everyone has lots of space. Getting into scheduling, timing, and rep counts. When you're teaching the schedule, try to go with the schedule if you can. If you need to skip some things, do it if, to stay on time. Um, try to manage your time. So practice these skills yourself and exercises to see how long they actually last. So when you write them on your lesson plan, write exactly how long you're going to perform each skill for so that you know how long that skill should take. Okay. Otherwise you're going to go over or under. Okay. So make sure you're writing the time and the rep count, not just the rep count of what you're performing. When it comes to spacing, uh, make sure that students are spaced out that you know not everyone's um, clumped together that you're able to get them scattered when it comes to equipment we have big equipment small equipment bright equipment um, so make sure that you have different types of equipment for your sport you have if it's tennis you have different types of balls like the tennis balls wiffle balls the um, the kids tennis balls which are a little bit bigger uh, we also have the pickle balls and we have the yarn balls and you can use poly spots. So there's just different approaches and balloons. Um, so making sure that you have different equipment if needed for your sport or activity. 
comes to your voice, make sure you're using the microphone. If you're not using the microphone, you need to make sure everyone can hear you. When they are listening to you, make sure that you can see their eyes. If you can't see their eyes, they probably can't see your eyes. So make sure everyone can not only see you, but see your eyes. So um, some people can't hear because of the, uh, the gymnasium is a loud place and some people have hearing uh, disabilities. So they might be looking at your mouth directly. So make sure they can see your mouth too. When it comes to um, your voice as well, make sure that you can speak up, that you're basically almost yelling throughout the whole class because everyone needs to be able to hear you. Otherwise, you need a microphone and they can only hear you on the microphone if they are facing the direction of the, the amp or the speaker. So make sure they're facing the speaker when you're teaching them. And try to bundle them up and get them close together when you're teaching them. Otherwise, the, the sounds of the gymnasium are just too loud and overbearing. When it comes to teaching tasks, provide regressions and progressions. So option one, try this. Option two, this is the exercise we're gonna focus on. Option three, if you're a little bit more progression, progress-based, we're gonna try this exercise. So you can have three options, but if three options is too much, have one or maybe just one or two options. Think about the students you're teaching, know the students you're teaching, know the options that each student might need, okay? Um, that's being a great teacher and a um, with it teacher. Make sure you're giving students feedback, whether that's the assistants that are helping you or mentors that are helping you. Make sure you're giving people constant feedback. Good job. Even if it's very generic, move around, say exactly what they are doing right if you can. So if they are doing a hip lift for a long time, be like, those are some strong legs. Uh, you know what I mean? So it can be specific to what they're doing. That always helps. That's gonna help it register and um, talking about their effort is gonna be important too. So I really like the effort you're putting in. I really like to see, I really see those arms shaking. I can tell you're really pushing hard in that push up hold. So making sure you're giving people lots of feedback. Um, you need to be able to manage the students that are working with you or the assistants or the mentors. So telling them what you need from them um, giving them a clear understanding of the goals or the activities before it starts or tell them that they need to echo what you are saying to the student with a disability so that they should be kind of spitting images of you out on the floor. They can echo what you're saying to their ears, repeat what you said, or clarify the directions in their understanding. So sometimes the mentors are going to know how to communicate with the mentees better than you are so they might need to translate what you're saying into something a little bit more simple or into something maybe um, where they can model it first for them and then they are able to learn a little bit better um, so make sure people are helping you you don't feel alone everyone is here to support you everyone knows it's could be your first time teaching second time teaching but you need to tell them, like, hey, I'm not experienced, I really need your help today. Or you say, hey, I got a lot of experience, but I still am gonna need a lot of help. Um, I'm gonna need you to do this, you to do this, this is the plan. Um, hey, I need you to get this for me, great. And you know, support people while you're teaching, give people feedback, plan um, using standards, looking at the, uh, the documents that I provided and videos I provided, if I haven't provided you with documents or videos concerning a sport or activity you want to teach, make sure you email me and let me know what sport you're teaching or what fitness activity you want to teach, and I'll send you the direct information on what to teach, okay? So what to teach, I got your back. Why to teach, this is what you're doing, um, which is an amazing thing for people with disabilities. So know that this is really going to um, help someone, you know, maybe overco overcome something like a disability or, or maybe they're not confident because they don't play a lot of sports or they perform a lot of fitness exercises because they're not giving these, uh, they're not getting these opportunities elsewhere. So just know that you're providing uh, people with disabilities with um, really um, important and meaningful um, things that they're going to take 